I'm Connor Old and welcome to this month's episode of Masters of Controlled Chaos. And this month what we're going to be doing is looking at the films of Spike Lee. So if you're new to the series, what I do every single month is I do a long deep dive into a director's filmography. I talk about the central idea as to what makes them great and their influence they've had on the film going sort of community and world. And I also look at three seminal films in their filmography and how they sort of transition and try to create a narrative throughout their career. Now, Spike Lee, he's one of these directors that um, has always sort of been looming, I guess, over the show. Uh, starting off at the beginning of the show, I've always uh, looked at uh, filmmakers that were alive, um, people that I really admired, respected, the Coen brothers, Paul Thomas Anderson, you know, people I would still say who are still making movies today and still can make their best movie yet. Um, but now as a, sort of the, the, uh, we're into wave three now, we sort of transitioned away from that. And I've been trying to pick film uh, filmmakers that uh, are either have passed away so that I can really talk about their legacy and sort of their complete career arc um, or filmmakers that are sort of maybe near the end uh, of, of their career seemingly. Um, someone like Peter Weir for example who hasn't made a film in nine years and is getting a little bit older unfortunately. Uh, so I try to look at those filmmakers because it's, it feels a little bit wrong sometimes when I was talking about Paul Thomas Anderson and Phantom Thread hadn't come out and I was like you know, Phantom Thread, I think, is one of his best movies. I might have even put that in that episode because I still think he's a, a director that's still very much in his prime, as you would say, and still, I think he's going to make movie, great movies until the day he dies. Um, so it's kind of hard. I've always tried to stay away from directors that are still working today. Um, but I think it must have been... Uh, the, all those sort of Black Klansman love, I guess, last year that really made me realize that I had to do a series and I knew that for this wave I had to cover Spike Lee and I really did a huge deep dive seeing a lot of his films, even the ones that are sort of uh, mixed to negative, uh, trying to understand even his documentaries and trying to understand com a complete career arc because the fact is, is that he's been making movies for uh, four decades, you know, in, in the 80s, in the 90s, uh, in the 2000s, and now the 2010s, and, and all successful in, in those various uh, decades. So he's a filmmaker that even if he were to die today, of, oh, I hope he doesn't, um, obviously I want to make so much more movies, but even if he were, you know, he would still have an amazing legacy and would make, you know, some really great classic films. So I thought, you know what, let's give the the awards, the trophies to them while they're alive because, you know, we so rarely do that. And I feel like that he's sort of been a figure that's been looming. I've been dodging him, even though he knows he's a phenomenal filmmaker. I've been wanting to talk about him. I've just had some reservations because I didn't want to talk about him while he's still alive or while he's still making great movies. Because look, last his last movie, Black Klansman, just won an Oscar. So you know, he's still got a lot of it in the tank, and I still um, really respect uh, his his passion and, and his movies in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I think what really sort of um, is a defining characteristic of Spike Lee that I want to talk about sort of in a historical mo moment at the top of the show um, is that he really opened the door for African Americans and African American storytelling, especially in regards to behind the camera. Um, if you don't know, you know, there's the African American sort of experience. Um, I'm not extremely, uh, you know, uh, knowledgeable about it. I do want to say that I'm not a scholar by any means. But throughout my research and, and my sort of um, general film knowledge, uh, the sort of traditional uh, courses that Spike Lee, without a doubt, I think you can say is the most influential, um, if not sort of the most uh, popular and really an established uh, American filmmaker alive today. Um, I don't really think it's 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 a contest or it's an argument because really you know you had sort of early filmmakers guys like Oscar Michaud um, who did sort of um, the first very first ones early on in, in cinema um, and then you have some guys like Charles Burnett who did some a couple of studio movies or some um, independent movies um, but really it, really the uh, African American movie going. Uh, Mecca um, and sort of the beginning, you would say, is um, with black exploitation in the 70s. Um, of course, yes, there were sort of uh, little bits there, but I think black exploitation was a very seminal period because this was the very first time where we were seeing um, black directors with black, all black uh, uh, casts, um, and uh, they were made sort of for black people. Um, and you know, I have great directors like Gordon Parks and Marvin Peoples um, that you have to sort of respect. But I think that in a way, that sort of pigeonholed them that because they were sort of restricted to this certain genre, it was, you know, made by black people for black people, starring black people. Um, but it was also, like I said, kind of limiting because if you're a black filmmaker, you had to play in this genre, sort of this exploitation kind of film, crime, um, that really Spike Lee almost broke. He, he broke that and entered into the mainstream in a lot of ways with his sort of 889 seminal film, Do the Right Thing, which became a very controversial film at the time. Um, and... Uh, 
was a film that um, sparked a lot of debate and, and conversation, but really because it starred Spike and he wrote it and he directed it and you know, it, it had some controversy at the Oscars, for example, it really became a, a national thing and I think broke the mainstream and it wasn't in sort of this black exploitation genre. And, and yes, there had been a couple films, but I think that Spike Lee and especially his career ongoing has become such a, a household name um, that few filmmakers really have because of sort of his identity, his persona, that I think he has to be respected in that sense. And not only is he just because he's black and he's just making movies, um, he's also very much uh, intensely interested and, and explores um, African-American stories. And he's very much a, a, a proud um, member of that community and uh, a person who wants to tell those stories and, and advance sort of um, African-American stories. And particularly um, being black in America. I mean, he's that's where he grew up, of course. So he has some, some personal relationships to that. And uh, he's definitely a personal filmmaker, I think. There are some things, themes that interest him, locations, how he shoots them. You know, he has this very much a stylistic, I would say, uh, approach to filmmaking. Um, but I do think that, you know, if it weren't for someone like Spike Lee in 89, you wouldn't have John Singleton, rest in peace, who two years later did Boys in the Hood and became the youngest um, director ever to get nominated for Best Director at the Oscars. Um, and then you have, you know, guys like F. Gary Gray, who just released Men in Black International and was doing big budget studio films and started in 95 with Friday. Um, so you have the, uh, these so many great um, directors that I think have, in, in a way, Spike Lee to thank because he made such a great movie in, in Do the Right Thing that was so critically acclaimed and, and very popular and sparked a lot of conversation and really um, confronted the idea of race uh, in a way that sort of was needed because they'd had sort of the driving Miss Daisies for, for so long um, that this was sort of showing, um, I, I would say, the African-American experience in the forefront and sort of the tensions and that film's all about that and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, but. What, what really I enjoy, um, just talking about, you know, why me and others enjoy his films is because he's um, a, v a really great director. And his style is really what makes him such a great filmmaker and, and a recognizable filmmaker, like so many other great filmmakers like uh, David Fincher or Wes Anderson, for example. Um, but I really think that, you know, there's a common criticism aimed at Spike Lee that he's sort of an angry filmmaker. Uh, and I think that's a simplistic argument. Um, I don't think it's actually true, especially if if you see his entire filmography, it really becomes clear, I think, that he's very interested in themes like many other directors um, throughout his filmography. And, but there are a couple different ones and they sort of play off each other. Um, one that I think is the central one, which is um, society and society's role and how we, uh, sort of the societal structures of how we live our life. Um, and that sort of bleeds into, I guess, sort of familial relationships and that dynamic, so societal dynamics between, you know, between race, between uh, gender, between family, and sort of that aspect and sort of the conflict that can occur because of that. Um, you know, I'm thinking of movies like uh, Crooklyn and Drug Jungle Fever and He Got Game and Bamboozled and She's Gotta Have It. I mean, She's Gotta Have It has something like, you know, feminism. Bamboozled is a very obvious sort of satire of uh, blacks in, in media. Um, he Got Game about how, uh, you know, athletes are treated in society. There's all these different aspects um, of sort of society's viewpoint and how they treat them and how they either respect them or they don't respect them and how to sort of evaluate uh, sort of uh, get above that and, and get above that standard. Um, uh, Evelate uh, and uh, I think another theme uh, that uh, is very prevalent, I think, in his films is um, just I think he's fascinated with um, morality and ethics and you know sort of finding the answers to impossible questions in that sense. Um, you know, I'm thinking of films like Do the Right Thing or Malcolm X or um, 25th Hour, uh, where he just questions um, whether it be your last day of freedom or whether it be, you know, is, is violence good or bad? Did Mookie do the right thing? I mean, that's sort of a, a central question in that film. Um, those are some questions that he's always very fascinated in, in morality. I mean, even Old Boy, his remake of Old Boy, is very much that in that sense that he's interested um, in sort of um, uh, relationships and sort of twists and sort of um, trying to understand uh, these impossible questions that really are impossible. Um, but in a lot of ways, you know, that's his, his themes that he's interested in, too, but he's also, like I said, a very interesting stylistic filmmaker. Um, he often employs, um, I would say, you know, he's, he's a blunt filmmaker in the sense that of his themes or with the topics he likes to explore. Um, and he's also sort of a, a vibrant filmmaker. And vibrant because he uses many different colors in his films, you know, whether it even be something like Do the Right Thing, where you have the reds and the greens, or Chirac, where you have the oranges and sort of the, the purples and the blues. Um, 
those are very clear, distinct guidelines as far as that works. That makes sense in that film. Um, but also he, he employs that and they're sort of an, an over the top, sort of elevated, um, accentuated, eccentric um, uh, tr truth, you know, um, that, that, that's going on there. Um, in a lot of ways, he's trying to find um, the truth, the real truth, the deep truth by um, lying, by trying to make fiction, by trying to um, overemphasize it to real, sort of reveal an, an inner truth. Um, and you, he's a vibrant filmmaker, not just because of colors, but also just the way his films are paced and his energy. But energy is sort of a hard term to define, really. But I sort of define it as um, multiple different techniques used to create an overwhelming, um, fast, rapid pace that is... Um, uh, it's almost palpable in the sense that you can see it and you understand it and there's a vibe. You know, there's slow movies that you understand that this is a slow burn is a common thing, but then there's energetic movies and he makes energetic movies like a, like a good fellow, like a Martin Scorsese, I think he makes energetic movies unless he's making Silence, for example. Um, but Spike, in that sense, you know, with his comic collaborator, editor Barry Alexander Brown, um, they sort of... Uh, uh, edit in a lot of ways to music and the rhythm of music, which by the way, Spike has some of the best soundtracks. Um, and then his camera movements, sometimes you'll use Dutch oblique angles, you'll, you'll always move the camera in a lot of ways, um, either tracking shots or push-ins. Sometimes the directors, the actors look directly at the camera. Um, he is famous for one of his famous, famous shots is the double dolly, in which the camera is on a dolly, sort of like a, a rail track that's either moving backwards usually. But the, the the actor is also on the dolly, so they're moving at this. They're at the same speed as the camera. It's a very distinguishable shot, and it seems like almost like they're gliding through, and everyone else is walking normally, and they're sort of gliding through this space in sort of a weird three dimensional, fourth dimensional almost kind of um, uh, representation. Um, so I, there's a lot of different aspects of it. Um, but like I said before, he's also a blunt filmmaker in the sense that, you know, he's never going to let you leave a film without um, knowing what he's talking about. You know, he doesn't pussyfoot around in that sense. He completely understands, he wants you to understand what kind of what kind of message he is saying or what kind of topic he's bringing about. Like something to do the right thing, I don't think he's saying one explicit answer. You know, or he'll maybe hint at it in certain aspects, but I think that he just, but what he does make very clear and very much in your face is the idea that you know this is a topic what is the right thing you know there's tensions going on here we get that you know i mean he's, he's blunt in that sense but i do think that that should exist i think a lot of times people overemphasize something like ambiguity but i think that something like uh, statements and sentimentality should be able to exist because art ultimately movies are art and all art is ultimately a form of expression that's trying to get you to express yourself so i think that both should be allowed and something that's very blunt and in your face should be allowed it's the same way sort of ambiguity should be around i think spike is sort of a master of being sort of blunt and being in your in your face and letting you know what the message is um and making you really struggle with that message because a lot of times like i said in the morality aspect that they're answering trying to answer um unanswerable questions um and really He's trying to confront the truth by laying out sort of a message for you to decipher and discuss and really open up that conversation. I think Spike definitely tries to do that with a lot of his movies. All right, so transitioning into my first movie that I'm going to be talking about, with it, which is Do the Right Thing. So, like I said at the top of the video, this is really the film that put him on top of the map uh, and put him on the map, and, and really it's due to him. I mean, you can't really say it's, you know, really John Turturro steals, steals the movie, because it really is Spike's movie. He wrote it, he directed it, and he starred in it. When you think of this movie, you think of no one but Spike Lee, in my opinion. And um, this was a film that, um, you know, has actually persisted as a classic. I saw it um, most recently um, as part of my film course that I just took in university. Uh, my only sort of introduction to film uh, and, uh, you know, sort of, you know, this is of the likes with you know, Jimbo and Mildred Pierce and uh, Psycho and Rear Window and these sort of all-time classic movies. Um, this is a part of it. This is sort of seeing it. And it's been taught in University Spike Lee um, is a teacher for over 20 years now in New uh, NYU, New York University. University, um, and it's sort of hard because you know it's it, it's almost impossible to make a movie better than this in certain ways. Like it's it's, it's hard to say, oh, Spike, really, Twenty Fifth Hour is a secret masterpiece because there's always this sort of looming in the back, and it's arguably seen as his best. And I would agree that it, it is his best. Um, and I think that you know it, it, it makes sense that it was controversial at the time because it talks about certain topics that are very um, taboo, and he, he talks about race um, in a head front blunt aspect, and does it through tension and, and, and sort of anger in this movie. You know, he's not an angry filmmaker, but he does do anger. Um, I think in this movie. Um, and I think that the central, sort of on a surface level at least, the central theme of the movie, uh, very sort of on the top level, um, is that 
the conflicts that arise um, due to differing ethics, moral behaviors, relationships between two groups that are different from one another. In this case, it happens to be race, um, whether it's you know the Latinos, the Koreans, um, or, or you know the, the African Americans, or, or the Italians, um, and sort of all their sort of dynamics. That even it's not really sort of a binary the whites versus the blacks. It's really sort of a full sort of cultural dynamic because they're all together within this one community and they're all in their own sort of way immigrants. Um, and it really looks at the, the conflict that can occur there and how that tension really rises. Um, and this is a film that you have to see the full thing because, to really respect it and to understand it and appreciate it because the ending is so impactful. One of the all-time best endings, I think, because it really is all leading up to this. Um, so, you know, it really, it, on the, on the, it really tackles, from a, a story perspective, it tackles, because at the end, it makes you question the title of the movie in a lot of ways. Um, did Mookie, the Spike Lee's character, do the right thing? That's sort of a central topic that everyone talks about. Um, you know, that's a valid question, but it's also questioning, like, is that even the right question to ask? What is the right thing? You know, at one sense, it's binary, looking at what's right versus what's wrong. But then it goes past that, ultimately. It goes past those simplistic sort of ways, because your right may be different from my right and your wrong may be different from my wrong um, because we have different sort of backgrounds and cultures then that, that affects our relationship to how we see certain things um, that, that's sort of very prevalent and by having these different um, cultures within this community um, they're able to sort of really uh, tackle those issues um, that everyone's experience is different and that the right and wrong are not let's say this uh, you know as clear as we think um, uh, you know, at the end, you see two quotes, from, one from uh, Martin Luther King a Jr. Um, and the other from uh, Malcolm X. One sort of advocating um, for violence necessarily in, um, for self-defense, and the other sort of advocating that violence is horrific and should never do it. Sort of two sides um, of the argument in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, I think Spike never really gives a clear answer as to what he just what's the right answer he what's the right thing he just presents it to you you know he doesn't want to solve he, there's a great sort of clip of him he says he doesn't want to solve the black experience in America he just wants to bring out that conversation and make you think and make you talk about it which I think the response was exactly what Spike wanted out of the film um, but also there's these little moments that really play up um, in a lot of ways the film that uh, play up to the ending, especially through rewatches. How you see sort of the black teenagers when they go into Sal's pizza, pizza shop, they look at the wall um, and they say, you know, why are there any brothers in, on here, Sal? Um, or even things like, um, uh, it's just, you know, it being the hottest day of the year, of course, as a visual representation of, of tension. Or when uh, Pino, uh, John Turturro's character, you know, doesn't really like being in this neighborhood. He wants to be in the Italian neighborhood. You know, Dad, why can't the shop be in the Italian neighborhood? Sort of that dynamic there, right? Um, and then, you know, there's e even some smaller things like, and the colors is a vibrant, very vibrant color movie. But then there's some clear sort of subtle, um, psychoanalytical, almost um, subliminal, I guess you would almost say, messaging where um, there's two different colors uh, that predominantly in the film, which is red and green. They're complementary colors. And the green is mostly associated in Sal's pizza shop and what um, uh, the Italian uh, Americans wear. And then the African Americans um, are mostly seen in red. Um, and so th they're complete opposites on the color wheel. So the, in a lot of ways, we see these colors already as different almost like black and white. Um, but also, we, there's little things like with the one white guy we see in the film, he's wearing a Larry Bird jersey, who, if you know Larry Bird, he was um, one of the only few white people early on in the NBA and very, very uh, what, sort of one of the, the best. Um, and his, he played with the Boston Celtics. His uh, color jersey was green. And Boston is uh, directly sort of... Uh, Oppo opponents of New York. They have a rivalry, so of course they don't like them when it's in, in bed -Stuy. Um And then, you know, uh, uh, Mookie's character has a Jackie Robinson jersey on. Um, Jackie Robinson was the first African American to play in the MLB. Um, and the Dodgers, um, it's not now the LA Dodgers, but it used to be the Brooklyn Dodgers, and the film takes place in Brooklyn. I mean, there's so many rich, clever little things going on that are throughout this movie that you can really explore and rewatch and really understand all these little different intricate details on top of really answering this really central question and this film really connects to me and it speaks to me in a lot of ways because I do like movies that question my beliefs and question my thoughts and make me think and make me come out of the theater thinking about it arguing talking um, trying to uh, sort of have an inner conflict and in, uh, reflection in, in yourself um, and on top of that just um, some beautiful sort of camera movements that were inventive and innovative and influential 
um, that really also affect and sort of hammer home the the, the uh, message of the film. And like I said, there's really just so many dynamics going on. There's old and there's young. There's different races. There's different cultures. There's different sort of statuses. Um, uh, the people's relationship to the police. Um, the sort of and you really I don't want to spoil the end, but the the end really sort of is the final. Uh, hurrah of sort of this escalating tension rising on the hottest of the year as things get hotter. Of course, you know, the tensions rise, you know, it's a, it's a clear sort of metaphor there. And as it arises, answers a central question that you can really deep dive and really understand. You can also understand the sort of the influential and really interesting um, stylistic choices, but then also trying to answer that maybe question, did Mookie do the right thing? But then realizing maybe that's not even the right question to ask. And then you go down this rabbit hole and it's just one of those movies that you watch it and it's really a brilliant film and it strikes an emotion out of you. I think you could never watch this film and never have some sort of, uh, you know, anger or, or happiness or sh sort of confusion. He really tries to get some emotion out of you. And like I said at the top of the show, I think that's what great art really does. Okay, transitioning now into the second movie I'm going to pick, which is Malcolm X. So, Malcolm X, uh, this is another film that came out pretty, pretty quickly after Do the Right Thing, three years after, in 92, yet it was actually the third film after Do the Right Thing came out. He also did um, Jungle Fever, I believe in 91, and 90 was um, School Days, I believe. Um, and so this was the third film. Um, no, it was Mo Better Blues was 90. That was right, because he reteamed with Denzel Washington um, for this, for, for Malcolm X. Um, and this is a film that really is hard to separate your love of it with Denzel Washington's performance, because he really is the central character of Malcolm X, and he does such a great job of Mal uh, Malcolm X, because the, char the, the real-life person of Malcolm X almost was perfectly made for a movie, because he had such a clear, defining character arc throughout his life, and he changed and evolved as a, as a man, which we, I think we all hope and, and, and try to achieve and to do as human beings. Now, but Denzel, really understands his character and really plays it to a pitch perfect aspect where you don't even have to understand um, Malcolm X and know all about this history because I think the film teaches you a lot, but also um, it's very quickly understand through Denzel Washington's performance, the empathy that he's able to bring to the character, but also his resonance, his relevance, um, and his importance as a historical figure in um, American history. Um, and, and because, you know, like I said, that character arc, he starts off as this sort of young, cocky kid who is sort of allured by the glitz and glamour of uh, the gangster life and then goes to jail and then eventually finds um, Islam and uh, uh, starts to fall prophet uh, Elijah Muhammad and, and joins the Black Power movement and became an influential figure in that and then gave speeches, um, but was very much um, clouded, I guess you would say, by anger and rage and hate um, in a lot of ways. Um, not all of his sort of messages at that time, of course, but especially a way the movie portrays it is that he, he's maybe saying some things right, but he's also clouded a lot of sense by his sort of pure hate um, for um, white people in the sense. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, eventually, when he denounces um, the Prophet Elijah Muhammad um, and really refines his faith when he goes to his journey to Mecca, um, he, he he really sort of has a, a spiritual awakening and starts to change his tune, change his message. We all, you know. Um, and uh, he started to, you know, ultimately uh, realize that, uh, you know, everyone should be sort of accepted. Um, that, you know, he wants to uh, respect everyone. Everyone deserves respect and love. And um, I think that's such an interesting char uh, character arc and, and career. And it's so unique to see it and see really Denzel Washington. He plays these three, almost three separate characters in one movie. It's so hard to beat for him almost to do another performance as good as this because there's almost so few characters that are as good as this because he, Denzel Washington was able to play like this sort of young kid who's cocky and you know, wants to do all this great stuff. And then he plays this sort of a mature um, uh, 30, 40 year old man. Um, and then also sort of a, an elder man who was really sort of calm and at peace with his own life when uh, sort of he was very much uh, trying to be someone and he was someone and he was the man and his ego got so much above him and then he sort of uh, humbled himself in a lot of ways and Denzel Washington plays these three separate uh, stages of this man's life so brilliantly and so captivatingly and I think he really ultimately though understands the essence of Malcolm X um, which is that sort of that, that central period and that, and that later period which is what makes him captivating um, what makes what makes flocks of people come and see his speeches and want to just hear him speak um, it's because uh, Denzel, of course, the actor, um, is very charming, has lots of charisma, and I think Malcolm X has that same aspect to him. Um, but Denzel is more than that because it's not just you know being funny and, and coy, it's about sort of saying a message and saying it staunchly and saying it convincingly. Um, and Denzel really, uh, 
understands and is able to convey the resonance that this man has. And you almost feel in a way that, oh, you understand why people from all over the country came up uh, and, and w w saw his speeches and joined the party and joined the Nation of Islam and why it became such a big deal. And why in the 60s, um, with guys like um, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, um, there was a, a lot of sort of concern about uh, you know, the influence these guys had and sort of a possible uprising um, and writing and, and uh, writing. So, yes, there were some riots, but mostly protests, Martin Luther King Jr.'s particularly uh, peaceful protests um, and, and sort of standing out and, and staying uh, no to sort of oppression at the time. Um, and it makes sense for Spike to do this because he was the one that really brought that in, into film in a lot of sense. What, um, uh, Malcolm X was trying to do in, in his life, which is sort of um, show that, you know, it's been less than 100 years of slavery at the time uh, has been abolished. And they were saying, you know, you know, this is not right. We should deserve rights. Um, and, and was very passionate about that and really confronted that issue and wasn't trying to sort of slowly integrate. They were very much um, aggressive um, and very much made their point clear and, and were fed up because they were being treated so poorly for so long that they, this was really a breaking point of them. And I, th I think Malcolm X um, was able to rally that and you see that throughout this movie, um, throughout the sort of three different generations, you would say. Um, but even though it's hard to think about this movie without Spike, you have to, if, without, sorry, Denzel, you have to realize that Spike Lee ultimately directed this movie. And you actually can tell, obviously he's in the movie, um, but, you know, it is his direction of getting that performance out of Denzel. We can't just think of all on Denzel because Spike used him in the proper way. Um, you know, in something like Training Day, his Denzel's Oscar-winning movie, you almost have to use him sparingly because he's so outlandish and over the top, not over the top, but sort of uh, brash and ego and, and charismatic in that movie that you have to use him sparingly. But in this film, when he's a central character, when he's a titular character, it's really a character study and you have to use him in almost every single scene. And that's a different sort of kind of direction that you have to give. And I think Spike does that very well. Um, and also, I think uh, a lot of credit here to Barry Alexander Brown, his editor, because this is a film that feels like, doesn't really feel like three hours, in my opinion. There's so much going on, there's so many interesting things that goes from one um, sort of era to the next very convincingly, um, even sort of just the speeches of knowing when to cut between Malcolm and staying on him and just being allured by his sort of power and his um, interest and his charisma, um, and then also coming back to sort of audience reactions and sort of the, 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 the actual impact that he had, understanding that this is a man's life, but also understanding that there's impact that just to be analyzed and, and talked about. Um, so I think that uh, it's such a fascinating time in, in history, a very interesting character, um, and Spike really was able to masterfully do that without sort of being so, it's really transitionary period because he's not so, super um, blunt and you know, this is my style. He's very much sort of subdued in a lot of ways. Um, there are some typical sort of Spike Lee things, but he's trying to tell the story and let the story speak for itself, and I think he does an excellent job at that. Um, so transitioning now into my final movie I'm talking, gonna be talking about, which may be a controversial one, but I ultimately picked 25th Hour. So, in a way, I feel like this is almost a betrayal to Spike Lee um, because, like I said at the top of the show, you, kind of, you said he's such an influential figure to the African-American experience and he makes, you know, I think it was 83% of his films were about um, either featured an African-American lead or an African-American ensemble. So why are you choosing now to choose a film about um, a white guy and his two white friends and, you know, his Puerto Rican girlfriend? Um, and, and yeah, that's something I've thought about and I did, wasn't sure if I really wanted to talk about, but also I think that does a disservice to Spike Lee and his career because, like I said at the top of the show, you know, black exploitation was a genre, but it was very limiting to black filmmakers because they had to make this sort, sort of certain type of movie. And I think in a lot of ways, if I just if I said Spike Lee just makes black films, that would almost be inherently exclusive and, and, and not true to his filmography because he makes films like um, Summer of Sam and Clockers and 25th Hour and Old Boy and even Inside Man to a certain extent, where you know those films are not about um, the black experience. They often uh, feature you know white um, protagonists. Um, so I think that to talk about this, that's like a, a good portion of his career that you know is, has nothing to do with black filmmakers. And I think actually uh, the black community, I think actually transcends um, his respect, at least in my mind, because he's not just sort of you would say a one-trick pony or interested in this one thing, which would be fine. He would make amazing movies. But he's also does more than that. He wants to do a heist film, just a cool genre film. He wants to talk about this really interesting, fascinating thing. He doesn't care about um, that is start not starting an African American. Um, 
he cares about uh, the story and, and wants to tell sort of great stories. And, and, you know, he wants to propel these African-American stories because he feels like they've either been, been marginalized or has just haven't been told and they want, he wants to tell them. But he, that doesn't mean he's opposed to telling these other stories that he also think are really fantastic. So I think this sort of represents all those kind of movies in a lot of ways. But one thing, though, that all these movies have in common that have in common with his other films is New York. This is a, 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 a movie that very much has to do with New York. And he's a filmmaker that very much loved New York and Brooklyn and sort of that um, environment. Um, and what's the most significant event that has ever happened to New York City? 9-11. Um, and this is a film that very much tackles those issues. 9-11 um, took place just a few weeks before shooting um, of this movie, and they sort of incorporated it into the movie um, in pre-production and definitely in post-production and in how they edited it. Um, so while not directly a 9-11 a, a movie about 9-11, very much, I think, captures the... the the feeling that you must have after a huge event. Now, um, I don't remember where I was when I was when 9/11 happened because I was just a young kid, um, so I can't say oh I remember what it was post 9/11. But I didn't grow up in a time um, where you know that was sort of just the norm, and you read about things. Um, like how it sort of used to be, how you just go on planes and there was not a big deal and there was no TSA and things like that. But that's the small things. Um, what I really think this captures is sort of a certain confusion that's going on, a certain malaise, and they do it through Ed Norton's character, which if you don't know, this is about a, a, a film that covers his last 24 hours before um, he is um, to go to jail for seven years. And it talks about his relationship with himself, um, sort of pondering, you know, what led him to this point, questioning on, you know, blaming others, blaming himself in, in this sort of really brilliant sequence where he, you know, uh, this sort of hate speech where he does for like a five minute monologue where he blames every single group and he blames himself and he blames his friends, but really sort of it ultimately comes back to him. Um, and, and sort of a taking a, a proactive approach, that, that approach versus sort of um, a passive approach, I guess you would say. And it was very interesting. And the film really floored me in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, also there's, there's that aspect where he's internally sort of questioning things, but then there's also relationships, his girlfriend, his, his friends, you know, it was very much an adult friendship in the sense that a lot of their defining characteristics were, um, and, and their memories were as they were um, kids and, and teenagers is when they built their trust. But now it's sort of using that cachet as a trust. Or, you know, now that our lives have led to this certain point, you have to look back. What led to this? Why, as a friend, did I let this happen? Um, and I think Spike Lee also has some really amazing and uh, restrained camera work in here. I think sometimes he just leaves on one shot and just lets it play out and lets the themes wash over and just let this conversation, like you're sitting there and you don't know what's happening next. I mean, brilliant writing by David Benioff, which is one of the co-creators of Game of Thrones. Um, uh, but Spike really knows how to emphasize that and does some really brilliant things. Um, he does a couple great double dolly shots and use them sparingly, so use them very much more effectively, I think. Um, and then you have all these amazing actors. Uh, uh, and Norton, uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Barry Pepper. Barry Pepper is amazing in this. He's so much better than I've ever seen him in, in, in other things. You know, he's, he's a great actor, obviously. But, you know, Saving Private Ryan, for example. But he really is phenomenal in this. And, um, uh, and we see sort of these different archetypes and how they all still are friends and their friendship dynamic and how Edward Norton's character is with his father versus how it is with his girlfriend. And um, there's just, it's just a, a morality question that I think is pure sort of Spike Lee in that sort of aspect where it's just fascinating. It's a film that I still don't really understand completely. And I think that's what all the great films are. You know, my favorite film of all time is her. Yes, I find so many, you know, or sometimes it's her, sometimes it's the Lord of the Rings. I mean, sometimes it's Taxi Driver. It always changes, but her is a great example, and Taxi Driver and Inside Lewin Davis, and where I don't really understand the movie completely. I'm still trying to figure it out, even though I've seen it 10, 20 times. I'm still trying to figure it out. There's still something that is unexplicable that just hits an emotional core within me. And this film did something very similar. Um, it really floored me. I don't really completely understand it because there's so much that you have to process and understand what would I do in that situation um, or what's sort of my legacy um, and will like be changed as a person. I mean, almost like the guy's dying even though he's still gonna be alive and then coming back and he's gonna be back um, as a changed person and almost preparing for that, but then how can you prepare for that? I mean, there's so many layers to this film. Um, so brilliantly, brilliantly, brilliantly written. Um, Spike Lee has an amazing sort of choice of camera movement and, and restraint, like I said. A beautiful acting, rather, uh, Rosario Dawson, I forgot to mention. Um, Brian Cox as Edward Norton's father. I mean, it's really an all-star stud cast and a film that I very enjoy and a film that I, I recommend to all, even though, you know, it's odd in Spike Lee's filmography, but it's still really, I think, a really great movie. Uh, but that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know some of your favorite Spike Lee video, uh, movies in the comments down below. Uh, that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the 
video. And until next time, stay tuned.